Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firm. I'm your host, Alex Gore. I'm here with Lindsay Divin. Lindsay teaches AEC marketing professionals the steps to modernize their marketing through training and technology. She's the host of the podcast, uh, Marketers Take Flight, and has a website of the same name. Welcome inside the firm. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show today. Hey, before we get into the nitty gritty, how did you get into the AEC industry? Oh, probably like a lot of other people, a lot of non-technical people. I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, my, I studied marketing in college and then floundered around at a couple of jobs. And then I replied to, um, a job posting on monster.com. I don't know if you remember that job I site, do. Uh, do. way back in the day to, for a marketing coordinator at an engineering firm. And they predominantly did transportation engineering and, um, and I got the job and the rest they say is history. And I've worked with architecture, engineering. So both the horizontal and my last firm was predominantly architecture. Um, and then they had engineering disciplines to support the architectural projects. And so how big was the uh, architecture firm? So when I left, <laughs> it was just shy of 300. Holy um, cow. What's the name? When of it? I, um, BRPH. BRPH. Okay. Yep. And when I started, it was only about 150. Um, so, How and now they're, were, oh, you, were you there? I was there for maybe four and a half, five years. That is, that is a lot of growth. A lot of growth, all organic, no acquisitions. It was, we were flying by the seat of our pants and they are still rapidly growing. Yeah. Um, I keep in touch with them today and they are, um, they are still rapidly growing. How, um, what was the growth from government work, new clients? How did they get them? You know, so a little bit of both. They had a really good balance of, um, they did a lot. Their bread and butter, they were born on the space coast of Florida, um, at some uh, space rocket engineers, literal rocket engineers um, that worked um Kennedy Space Center. So about 60 years ago now. Um, and so their bread and butter is aerospace engineering, manufacturing facilities, anything that supports aviation and aerospace. But then they grew to um, serve other markets. So so a lot, their bread and butter is like defense, aerospace, that kind of stuff. And then the companies that support defense. So like Boeing, Lockheed, Harris, and then, um, then they just grew locally, you know, into education. And then Orlando is a big theme park, so universal. And so they expanded with clients. So as the clients moved to different areas, they expanded their footprint. So they moved to Charleston when Boeing opened up the Charleston plant. You know, they have a big footprint in Seattle. If they need client, now they're growing a big footprint in um, Huntsville because of the space program there. So they just- That kind of, should have been have, in Colorado. Yeah, they did some top secret top secret work in Colorado. Yeah. I can't talk about a lot of it in Alaska as well, but really they really honed in on their client relationships and built um, a, you know, just really strategic relationships with their clients and would learn their business and see where the, the clients were growing and how the clients were growing and then would try to, you know, become that trusted advisor to kind of help them, you know, support their growth from a facility standpoint, really. Yeah. Um, so that, that was really the main driver. And then, you know, other companies, commercial space has been very hot um, and not just space, but satellites. So there's, you know, other um, adjacent type clients to those industries too, that they serve. Yeah. And if this is a total side note, but thinking about expansion, I've been, I've been listening to some uh, future forecasters and things like that. A lot of manufacturing could come back to the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. an area to, to grow in and expand or, or at least, you know, work yourself into. Um, okay. How did you go from there to starting your, your own shindig? 
Yeah. So part of it was, um, I was a little burnt out. Uh, it was really a lot of travel. I had a pretty big commute. So my husband and I, my husband's also in the industry. He works for a commercial contractor. So he does pretty manages pretty large commercial multifamily, you know, type projects. So two very stressful jobs that we were talking, we, we have kids. Um, and so we just needed a change. And so we decided to move, downsize, move, move closer to family. And part of that was, and this was like several years before COVID. And so it just, it was easier for me to resign than try to work remotely and grow my team um, at that point. Now, if this would have happened during COVID, I think it would have been a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I've always wanted, I started my business and my blog way before I left and was doing it as a side because I've always wanted to help those who are new to our industry um, from the marketing and business development side kind of acclimate a little bit faster. But then I always have a sweet spot for, you know, smaller firms that may not have a dedicated marketing person, but still want to, you know, deploy mar some marketing strategies, some easy to deploy or non-time consuming marketing strategies, because let's face it, we need to market our firms to get more work, um, especially you know, we keep hearing hints of a recession. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't see it really in our industry yet. That doesn't mean it's not coming. Um, but, you know, we need to be prepared for it. And marketing really helps with that. Yeah, I agree on two levels. Um, it's hard to make this decision, but if everyone pulls back marketing during a recession, those that don't will win. The other thing too is what most people might not be familiar with is we're not a large firm um about nine we, we fluctuate between nine and eleven you know mm -hmm. so, so, yeah mm -hmm. uh but the amount of resources and stuff that we have put in and then now the amount that we're leveling up in mm -hmm. um would probably surprise some people so if you're in competition against against us um mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard it's gonna be hard yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's so, good that's good <laughs> yeah um, okay, yeah. so let's dive into the, how we can help. Um, here's a question. Why uh, architecture firm leaders shouldn't ignore their social media, uh, not only just for their firms, but also for recruiting? Yeah, so the biggest thing, you know, a lot of people are hesitant, especially, you know, busy for people running firms. They're like, why do I need to be on LinkedIn or Twitter? And my biggest pushback is, you know, those are search engines. So they act just like Google. And so when you have a presence on those and somebody searches your name or they search your, um, you know, they're looking for architectural services or they're looking for your firm name, it comes up and, and they'll be like, well, nobody does that. You know, people don't do that. And I say, well, where's the first place you go as a person when you want to find out something new? Like we're shopping for new appliances right now. And the first place I went to was Google and what is the best, you know, fridge. And so the first place we go to online as consumers and anybody looking for services is we go to Google or Bing or Safari. We go online to look for no it. No one goes to Bing or Safari. I know. I know. I just didn't want to be <laughs> like totally biased towards Google, but yeah you know, or they ask Siri, right? My husband doesn't even type in things anymore. He has a great relationship with his Siri and nice. he just asks her. So if you're not even online any way, you're not even going to be in the running. So I think you need to, um, you know, and same thing with recruiting, um, you know, the younger people and even like, I'm not so young anymore, but I go online and look at firms and look at, you know, the culture and look at their social media to see what they're posting. If they haven't posted anything for 2015, since 2015, I might assume they're out of business. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I look at websites and, and I know they're in business because I just met with them, right. Or their competition. And I see their website and I go, Oh, are you, are you out of business though? Like mm -hmm. you literally, the, the, the last project was from 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, the website builder was from 15 years ago. Um, so crazy. So, yeah. uh, what 
what are some of the first steps then that they can do to become more visible online and, and show expertise? Yeah. So I think you first start with your website. Just make sure that A, you have a website. Um, it's so easy today to, you know, between all the templates and the kind of the self builders to, even if you can't hire somebody, you could probably hire a niece or a nephew yeah. <laughs> to, to build it for you or an intern, but make sure you have your website on and that it's current. Um, another kind of low hanging fruit, and this also helps with SEO is your Google listing. So every, every company, if you search, you know, architecture firms, Gainesville, Florida, that's where I'm located. Mm -hmm. There will be a list and a map of all of the architectural firms there. And to get that listing, um, you can add your own and it's free. And you just set up, it used to be called Google, my business, but now it's called a Google business account. And you can set that up again. It takes. Um, a little, you have to have a Gmail account and then it linked to that, but you can kind of Google how to do that, but you want to make sure that that's set up to make sure that you have your firm name, your address, correct, your phone number, correct. And your, maybe even your hours and may, and what's called like a meta description, which basically describes what your firm does or what your company does and that, and if you have multiple locations, You'll want to do one for each address and that'll really help just get that on that initial page when somebody is searching, particularly for a location. So, um, that's interesting. So like, let's say you're in Gainesville and you have uh, ABC architects and then you move to, uh, Miami, you would, it would be, do you know the technicalities? Is it a different Gmail account? Can you use the same Gmail account? Are you can you... use the same Gmail account and then you can just keep e either adding locations or change or modify the location. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that, that I would say um, your website, your Google, my business, and then a LinkedIn page um, with your business um, linked with you, you are a profile, you as the founder, or you as the key, um, you know, face of the firm, your profile, um, your LinkedIn page and with pictures, not just like the little, you know, make sure you have your profile picture updated, make sure you have like the banner image. It could just be a picture of your project. Even, um, your profile picture picture should be you. Um, and then your LinkedIn page and you showing that you work there. Um, because that also, when somebody Googles will show up, your LinkedIn stuff will show up in Google, in Google results as well. Um, when somebody Googles your name. So you just want to make sure. And then you said you guys have like nine employees, make sure that they're all linked to your business page, like showing that you're working there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think those are the three low hanging fruits to get started website, Google business profile and LinkedIn page and profiles for your employees. That, okay. I like how you said that that's a great starting point, but you can't just do it and forget it. Yes. So yeah. how do you spend, you know, do you have to spend an hour? Can you spend 10 minutes, you know, per week kind of maintaining and building this presence? Yeah. So if you choose LinkedIn, what I would recommend is maybe starting with one social platform. Um, ideally, I like to start where my potential clients kind of hang out. Um, so if you're residential, like if your folk, if your practice focuses on maybe residential architectural, maybe that's Instagram. If it's more like business or, you know, institutional kind of architecture, it's, it, it might be LinkedIn. Um, or Facebook. Um, so I would pick one and then make sure that A, you have your page or your profile built out for that. Let's just use LinkedIn, for example, for today. Make sure your page and your profile are, are um, filled out. And then you want to go and follow um, and connect with a couple of people a day. You don't need to do thousands, but do some searching. First of all, connect with all your current clients, um, all the people that the contacts and the pages that you're currently working with, because you probably already know them. Um, and so 
then you can start interacting with their content. And I usually do this two to three times a week. I'll just go and first, you know, I'm connected to all of them. And then I'll look in my feed or I'll just go and pick four people and I'll look in there, you know, I'll go look at their profile, look at their activity and comment on them um, or client pages. So if you work with a certain university or a certain healthcare system, you can go to their page and comment and you can comment as your profile or you can comment as your page. I kind of do half and half. Um, so when you comment on, and what's the commenting is so much more powerful than just liking because the comment, anybody who sees their posts will see your profile or your page. So I always try to leave some meaningful content, uh, comments on those. And you could just do this like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and right now, what I'm telling you, you're not even creating any new content. You're just going out there and you're mingling, right? You're really just mingling and interacting with your current clients um, right now. That's kind of step one. And that'll give you some brand exposure and hopefully people will give you some you know, connection requests or some page follows from that. Okay. Um, if you had to recommend to architecture firms or construction or engineering firms, right. all in the same boat, uh, how should they think about marketing in terms of these two different avenues? One, a marketing budget. Is there like mm -hmm. a percent of revenue or something like that? And then two, what should they do with it? Meaning, um, hey, spend it on content. Hey, spend it on ads. Um, and then be like, okay, if that budget gets so big, then now at this point, you should be hiring a person or, mm -hmm. or hiring an agency or hiring a Lindsay. Um, mm -hmm. So two parts. Yeah. So I'm going to say it all depends. <laughs> what I usually um, tell my students and my clients is you start with your firm's goals. So if you're, and that'll dictate your budget too. So if you're, if you're wanting to get into a brand new market, a brand new vertical, like you've never done healthcare and now you want to start doing healthcare projects or a brand new geography, you know, you're in Gainesville, but now you want to start working in Miami. So that's going to dictate, that's going to be a higher budget than just trying to get, let's say maybe your goal is to just get your clients to refer you your services to all their friends and family. That's going to be a very different budget, those two things. So it really, I always say, start with the firm's growth goals. How does the firm want to grow? Because that'll dictate how much money you need to spend and what you're going to spend it on. And I always recommend usually, no matter what type of growth goal is to spend, um, hopefully you have some kind of number around that growth goal, you know, whether it's, we want to earn enough to add another employee. So you kind of can know like what that revenue per employee is. And so then you can do a percentage of that, like, you know, three, 4% of that, you know, revenue per employee, if that's what your growth goal is, or you want to win three new projects in Miami. And so you have a sales goal of like, okay, well, how much are those revenue? And then you can do, I've seen marketing spend percent of revenue anywhere from as low as 2% up to like 8%. It really just, again, depends on the barriers to, you know, getting the, that revenue. So, um, and, and so you have your, your growth goals and then you kind of estimate kind of what the expected revenue it, you know, you're going to get with those growth goals for your firm. And then you can decide your marketing budget, okay. excuse me. And then you can decide, okay, well, what kind of marketing are you going to do? And I am a big proponent of content marketing and thought leadership marketing because it works so well with architecture because that's what we're selling is your thoughts, your expertise. Like we're not selling plans. We're selling your, you know, your designs in your head, your, your, the way you approach a project. So I think thought leadership and content marketing really plays itself to that. And it, in, it gets a lot more mileage than just running a Google ads campaign for three months. 
So it starts with content because you have to have something to put out there. Um, and content can be, it could be blog articles. It could be podcasts like this one. It could be videos. Videos are really hot right now. Like the TikTok, the TikTok effect is having its effect on all industries. Um, and architecture really lends itself well to, to imagery um, because our, our end products are so visible. It's so much more fun to market architecture than it is transportation, like roads. Um, cause those aren't <laughs> as sexy to like <laughs> yeah. photograph. Yep. Um, uh, so you can do, you can decide your content mix. So you can say, and that all depends on, you know, if you are trying to open an office in Miami for high-end residential, that imagery and that content and those type of videos are going to be very different than you're trying. And then if you're trying to do like, you know, suburban healthcare, facilities in, you know, Orlando, Florida, those are going to be very different types of content. So that's why I always say, start with your goals and what you're trying to achieve. So I've had a couple of people recommend, um, TikTok. I, I was on it and then like, I got addicted and I was like, this is just trash. Like I need yeah. to get off yeah. of it. So, uh, my, my hesitation is in my firm, I'm a decision maker. How many decision makers are actually on TikTok? Yeah. So I don't think I, you know, the jury's still out with me on TikTok. I'm just on it to monitor my daughter. <laughs> really. nice. Hopefully she doesn't watch this. Yeah. No, she knows. She knows. I tell her. Yeah. Um, but I think the style of the videos, you're, we're seeing it more and more on other platforms. Um, so those quick kind of to the point or flashy or entertaining type videos. I think it's really that style that you can take to, you know, you can produce a, a, a video um, like that, that can then, you know, it's not necessarily on TikTok, but you can kind of make a video like that and put you it put on, on YouTube, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. YouTube. I don't, Um, what's the other one? Oh, uh, Twitter. I'm sure you can put it. Twitter. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Twitter's not my favorite, but I do know a lot of people that like it. Yeah. Um, Why not? But it, it's just it, aesthetically, it's not the feed is not aesthetically pleasing. It's a little too chaotic for me personally, but there's a lot of people that like it. We did it a lot. Um, I was on it a lot to help my son with his college, his college recruiting for his high school. Oh, so there's yes. a lot of recruiting for it's football in case it. people didn't know which which makes yeah. a lot of sense yep. yeah 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 Deion sanders is all the all the rage now on on that yeah yeah so. um let's go back to kind of bread and butter um mm -hmm. i have two 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 questions uh to wrap this up and we'll take one at a time one is do you have recommendations for website builders that you like that work better and is that um are there also tiers, meaning, hey, just if you're just starting out mm -hmm. this or if you're mid growth or something like this, look at something else. How do you think about that? Yeah. So I personally, there's a lot of website builders out there. I have personally, I'll talk about what I've personally used. Um, and so, and then some others that I haven't, but I've heard good things about them. So first is WordPress. That's the tried and true. Um, it is, um, there's themes that you can buy. So my website is built on uh, marketerstakeflight.com is built on WordPress using um, Elementor, which is Elementor Pro, which is kind is like kind of the skin behind it that is they have pre-built templates and it's kind of drag and drop. It makes it really easy. Um, and so, but there's also just like out of the box templates for WordPress. It's a little, it takes a little bit to get, going in it, I would say there's a little bit of a learning curve, um, between kind of the plugins and the templates and the pages and the posts. But once you get the hang of it, um, it's, it's really flexible and because it's been around, it's kind of like the OG. There's so much, there's so many plugins, there's so much support. You can find consultants to help you. Like it, there's just so much. The other one that I use, um, I is HubSpot. Now HubSpot is, is not just a website, but if you're kind of starting your marketing from scratch, 
I would highly recommend HubSpot because it's a website builder. It's a social media scheduler. It's an email marketing soft. It's kind of like an all-in-one and it's also a CRM pretty simplistic CRM. So you can easily put up like forms, you can track people. So, and they, and HubSpot is a pretty big player. So there's a lot of consultants and templates that you can buy to just kind of get something up. Um, and I always tell people to just start basic. Like you just need a homepage. You need a page about your projects. You need a page about your people and like how to contact you and your services and how to contact you. And then once you start developing content, then you can, you know, create a blog, um, that, so you only need five or six pages to start with. Um, okay. did that, I think there, that was, oh, that you, was that, perfect. That was, okay. Yeah. Cause you said the second question too, and I forgot what that was. Well, there was a, I didn't answer yet. Um, you have a website, you've done all that. Do you have some tips to boost your SEO? Oh yes. Okay. So the first one is um, what I already talked about to make sure you get your Google business account because that will help you with your local SEO. And then you definitely want to have a website um, and you want to make sure that you have text, text on the website that explains specifically what you do. Your website doesn't need to get cutesy. I know I see some of these like architecture websites that you know, they try to be very creative, oh, yeah. um, but oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I am like, tell me what you do, who you do it for, like actual and written words, <laughs> what you do, who you do it for and why you're different than other firms and then list all of your services and list specific designs that you do and you don't do. So being very specific because Google reads all of those words. Yeah. And so they put them in, they log it in their search. Um, and so you don't want to be too cute. Now that doesn't mean it has to be ugly. You can still do use, you know, very good imagery. You can have your branding, but you don't want to be cutesy with the words. You want to be clear, concise, and say exactly what you mean. Um, and then the other thing is to make sure that you update your website. I wouldn't say frequently because that might freak people out, but you want to do it regularly. So I would say, because if you have a page, like we talked about earlier, that hasn't been touched since in 10 years, when you listed your last project, it's going to, it's going to hurt you in the rankings. Google likes pages and websites that are updated regularly. So make sure at the very least, make sure you're adding new projects to your website as you're completing them or, you know, when they're on the boards or whenever, you know, however you want to update them, that's a really good place um, to make sure it's updated. Um, the other one is if, when you do start content, you know, your blog page, you know, you can add a blog, even if it's a video, you can write a little description and have the video there. Um, and then, so th that's on your website. Off your website, again, is having all of your, so even if you're not gonna post on all your social media channels, make sure you have all of them set up with your correct name, you know, good description, your address, all of your, and have those linking back to your website as well. Um, including like you mentioned YouTube, that one's another one it's owned by Google. So if you have a YouTube channel, um, if you do have videos, put them up there because it does help in the search as well, because it is, it's its own search engine basically. So those are some like things that are good to get you started. So your website, crystal clear, updated frequently, Google my business or Google business profiles, and then your social media channels, just go and reserve them all for your firm's name now. Um, and then, you know, and make sure that they're, the profiles are accurate and have, you know, they've been updated since 2010. Yeah. <laughs> So for people who liked all this information, liked everything that you had to say, which is every listener to this podcast, uh, how can they get a hold of you? Um, where should they start? All that. Yeah. So the best place to start is I have a podcast, Marketers Take Flight, um, and I talk about all of this in more detail in all of my episodes. So if you want to learn more about marketing your architecture firm and content marketing and SEO, I have episodes all on that. 
Um, they can visit my website, marketers take And I am putting out, um, I have some online courses and trainings, um, and resource guides on marketers take One, I think that your listeners would, um, find valuable is a LinkedIn profile checklist. Mm. Um, and so they, it, I go through like what you should, uh, how you should update your LinkedIn profile. And so you can get that and give it, you know, and update all of your team's LinkedIn profiles using that resource. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, if there's anything else you want to leave our, uh, audience with. No, I think, um, I think, you know, just listening to the podcast marketers take flight. Um, I do mostly educational podcasts, so you'll learn a lot just by listening. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. 